Um, so we talked about this last time too, that I tried to explain to students, um, Enika and Bradley, that they're stepping into history. Like when you come to college, you can be aware of all the ways you were conditioned. Like you grew up in some kind of a bubble, right? Because there's only so much about the world a, a kid can know. And if you grew up well, all of your authority figures were actually sending the same signals, you know? And they are basic signals like self-control, um, courage to overcome fears like a little kid has a lot to be afraid of they have to sort of learn how to overcome that just basic stuff but when you come to college all of a sudden you meet people who were conditioned in ways that seem really different right but sometimes it's not that different so that's when you start figuring out what is it about life that doesn't change, that's the same over time, over place. And what is it that actually is different? And you're stepping into history at this certain time. Um, all right, so why don't each of you introduce yourself though? Um, because you wanna get to know each other over the semester. And so just tell each other something. Um, Nicola, did you write anything about your worldview? Uh, well, I guess, was that an assignment to do? Because Yeah, I, it, it did say that, but do you have anything? Yeah, to Go ahead. I apologize. I didn't even see the mail. This is my first time I saw the mail. So I'll try to do it as soon as possible. That's okay. Um, okay, Enika, how would you summarize what you said last time? What would you tell Nicola about your worldview? We have to write that down. Well, actually for your post for Friday. But you see, the point, the reason I ask you that is because when you have a worldview, it's in the back of your mind and you're always sort of checking, you know, you're always correcting it consciously or not. You run into different things. Your mind is trying to make sense of stuff. And the older you get, the more you really want to try and make sense of stuff. And that's why you have so many people with so many really weird points of view, <laughs> because they want somehow to make sense of stuff. Um, but anyway, is there anything you can say? Annika, you could just say like where you came from and your background too, but um, you could just, you know, make a few comments. You must notice that other people have these convictions about the meaning of life or something, and you have positioned yourself in some way. So what would you say to Nicola? No, I guess just like, based off your surroundings, you, um, I don't know. Okay. All right. I think last time you talked a little bit about Black Lives oh, Matter. Racism and, yeah. yeah. Okay. So you're aware of that. Um, I think you said you didn't, church wasn't a big deal for you. Is that right? No, I didn't say that. Yeah. Okay. Is, was church a big deal for you? Was that a... I go to church. Yeah. I like church. Okay. Um, because... I think it was Bradley that said that, and that was fine. Um, what did church mean to you? Because I personally, I think the African-American church has served a really important function to keep African-Americans, keep reminding them that they are gods. They are made in the image of God, even when the society was saying otherwise. Does that make sense? Yes. Is that how you felt? Did you feel like it's always reminding me that yeah, I can, I can do this. I mean, I just go to church. Just go to church. <laughs> I, never, I never know like reasons why people went to church. So. <laughs> okay, um, okay, Bradley, is there something you want to say to Nicola about your worldview or where you came from? Uh, yes, I did write something down. Uh, 
initially I kind of wrote that it was difficult for me to answer the question of what is my worldview because up until now I've never really thought about what that is uh, let alone uh, tried to define it and to make it more difficult I've I feel like as though I feel as though my opinions and stances and are constantly changing as I uh, as I grow up but I did manage to get some kind of uh, some kind of general statement going and I wrote that uh, no one is above or below another and that is to say that a human at their core can be neither superior nor inferior to any other human we are all equally as capable of doing good things as we are of doing bad things and although each of us possess qualities that differentiate us from each other, we do also have a lot of qualities that link us together. Great. Um, actually, <laughs> yeah, I think you're gonna like Greek philosophy actually. <laughs> um, all right, very good. Um, do you wanna say like where you came from? Uh, like location wise? Yeah. Yes, I came from Springdale, which is in okay. Northwest Arkansas. Okay, good. Okay, so, so this um, view of equality. Um, so ancient, the ancient view of equality emphasizes that we're just as capable of being uh, brutal <laughs> and evil as um, anybody else. Everybody's equally capable. Now, it sounds like, isn't that intuitively obvious? Well, during the modern world, the goal was to use social science to condition people out of brutality and people were not going to be that way anymore. That was the idea. So that's modern humanism is different from ancient humanism. Um, but the, you know, the lecture today is about, about ancient humanism. So. But I will start with the, just the syllabus and and also getting questions from Bradley or Enika about any questions they might have had. Um, all right, so here's how the syllabus works is we're going to meet at eight o'clock Tuesday, Thursday. Now, next week we meet at in person, because um, I'll be down there. And I'm not sure what room was set aside for this class, but I'll go look at the schedule. Do you all know, happen to know what room was set aside for this class? Anyway, you can look at the schedule. Oh, I guess they changed it to online. All right, so my office is in Alphen. And I will try to reserve the faculty room at the end of the hall in Elfin, but I'll reserve a room for us and it'll probably be in the second floor of Elfin. And we'll meet in person for two days. And then I'm going to be in Indonesia and we'll meet at that time. Um, and if there's any uh, possibility that I'm going to be like flying in an airplane or out of the I will let you know and I will record a lecture. And then the next day of class, I'll want you, will respond to two days of readings. So the next day we meet, if we miss a day, you'll react to the readings the day before. And then after about half the class, we'll start in on the readings for that day. So I think we can get caught up pretty easily. Um, okay, Nicola, there are three books that you need to order and they're cheap. You can get them used. This is a really cheap class. Um, you can have office hours um, by appointment mostly. I think I have another class after this class. Um, so we'll see though, I, I am available a lot and we will definitely work all that out. I have so few students, whenever you want to meet with me, if you send me an email saying, I would like an office hour, I think I'll be able to arrange something within 24 hours. Okay, here's the readings, the, the papers, learning how to write a paper, 
um, learning how to communicate. So when we have uh, a paper due, then you present your, the, you summarize the ideas in your paper orally by giving a more formal speech. So there's four times during the semester that you, you speak more formally to the rest of us and we ask questions. Then I'm, I'm looking for that your papers become more complex and creative. You're able to think in your own mind. You read something and you attach it. You give examples. You give analogies. You can see the comparison between the different traditions. Um, so that's what that is. The religion and philosophy program. Every lecture unites reason and faith in some way. So reason can mean scientific reasoning, social science reasoning, or um, an argument where you start with some definitions and you draw inferences and conclusions. So there's lots of different ways of reasoning. And then faith just means some idea of the good life, human flourishing, um, what the universe is like, how human beings fit into the universe. So, so like Bradley said, some idea of the good would be equality. And then you have to structure a whole society and your whole life on that idea. You can live your life for the sake of your idea of the good. Um, all right. And so every day I'll give you a different version of that because people have, there's hundreds of versions of that <laughs> out there. Um, and then the mission of Lion is to develop students who have these character traits. So they learn how to do it um, habitually, which is um, intellectual honesty, that you admit what you know and what you don't know, that you're committed to truth, that you are fair to opposing points of view, that you are patient with complexity and ambiguity, and you're tolerant of reasoned dissent. So people can disagree and they can have good reasons on both sides. So I've had students tell me, you know, that they really fear for my soul, that they think I'm gonna to go to hell. And I actually admire them when they, you know, have the nerve to tell me that. And I, you know, and they don't think they'll get graded down or they don't care because it takes some courage, you know. But on the other hand, I, you know, if somebody says that, <laughs> there's no argument, right? It's just a matter of faith. And so, like, I, I couldn't tolerate letting a student tell me that publicly in a class and shut down the class if they don't have any reasons, right? So there are some opinions that if people just say, I just believe it based on my faith, then you can't discuss it. And that's a problem. So, but I, I tolerate a lot simply because I'm in a position of authority. Okay, so you develop intercultural knowledge, um, Western and non-Western. You realize that adults create history, um, that the students of the next generation of students will study the history that you created. So you have to start thinking about, well, what kind of history do I want to create? Who do I want to be? What do I want my society to be? It's integrated learning, has all the different aspects of the culture, become more reflective and deliberate about your ideas of how you want to live, make more informed decisions about ethical reasoning and about the kind of civic engagement they want. Okay. The teaching is that I draw out from students what's in their minds. So I get to know their minds and I'm doing it, first of all, because I want to know what's on your mind, but also then you get to know what's on your mind because when you speak it, all of a sudden, there it is, it's out there and you become more aware of who you are. Um, attendance, the college has a policy. If you miss eight 
uh, times. And Nicola, I will not count the first one. Um, I won't even count it as excused. I just won't count it. <laughs> um, but don't tell the registrar, don't tell the authorities. Um, and let's see, because it was introductory and we can make up for that pretty easily. Let me know why you're absent. If there's any way, if you can know ahead of time that you'll be absent, the three of us, the four of us can figure out if there's a possible uh, time we can all meet, but it'll probably get complicated since there aren't a lot of hours when all of us are awake. <laughs> so I will record it. If you're absent, you can uh, read the material, write your three reactions, listen to the recording, write reactions to the recording, and have your final takeaway. So it's not hard for you to do the assignment just as if you were there. Um, then there's an absence policy. I'm usually not as harsh as this, but at least it's in the syllabus I could be. So the point is just come to class. Um, I'd like to get students engaged. Um, okay, so we have the big, the big thing in this class that is probably different, might be, I don't know, from other classes, is that before each class, you, before the first day of class, or for this week's post, you write your worldview for Tuesday, and then you write two things you learned during the class, and then you write your final takeaway, because your final paper is also going to be, what is my worldview? So you can see how much it changed from the first day to the last day. Okay, then the second day of class is a normal class day. You have readings before the class. You write down three reactions to the readings. We have the class, which includes students discussing their reactions. Then I give a lecture to try to summarize what the main points I wanted you to get out of it. And then uh, you write on your post, you write two or three reactions to what happened in the class that expanded your idea of the material. And then the final takeaway is, do you think there's anything from this class that you're going to put on your final worldview and why? So that's, <clears throat> <coughs> there are, uh, you have at least 150 words for each class and total of two classes each week. So the total would be 300 words. Um, and that's, that's a post and all together, they count for 50% of the grade. Um, so they count for five points each. I have, you only need to hand in 10 posts. I have actually posted, I think 12, or 13, so you can skip some of them um, because the grade book at the end will have just those 10. Now, you also have three papers. <laughs> They're like 1,000 words, 1,200, and 1,400. And they have three short quotes, four short quotes. So that's all on the stream. The topics are posted. Um, and in the last paragraph, you should answer the question, is there anything from this paper that I plan to put into my final paper? And then the final paper is the worldview. So each of the three papers is 10% of the grade and the final is 20%. Um, late papers, again, I just want to encourage you not to hand them in late. But many of you will have a good excuse, a good reason, and that's okay. Um, Sometimes I have, so I'm not real tough on that. If you think you might consider 
taking more RPH. And if you want to minor, you take six classes and then you make a file. So you make, because we, we like to do a portfolio and make a file of your original paper, your favorite other paper and your original worldview, at least those three. Okay, your time commitment. I try to make it reasonable, two hours of study per hour of class. So that would be two and a half hours for every one hour and 15 minute class. So we'll see. Um, so these are the total distribution of the points. The honor code policy. If you quote from one of the um, books that we read or the files. Now, I used to post on Schoology. So what you need to put is Google Classroom instead of Schoology. Put Google Classroom, um, RPH 140, and the name of the file. Uh, you could put the, the date of that attachment and then the name of the file. If it's for one of the books for the class, you could just put the last name of the author and the page number. Um, all right. If it's from an article or a book outside of the class, you have to do a regular work cited page. Um, I'm not going to take you to the honor council if you just follow these basic rules. Um, but sometimes a student really does quote from or paraphrase from one of the readings and they don't put any citation. And that's not fair because you're taking somebody else's ideas and presenting them as if they're your own. So I would like you to be careful about that. So that's just being intellectually honest. And you, okay, so if you really like something that Houston Smith said and the way he said it and the point he made, and you want to include that in your paper, that's great. Just make sure you give Houston Smith the credit for it. Um, so there are rules to follow for plagiarism. Um, you can collaborate. You can talk to other students about your ideas. It's when you sit down to write your thesis statement that that's your own work. Um, harassment, these are standard things for every syllabus. Um, all right, last day to drop, whatever. Um, now, do you have any questions? Anybody have any further questions about that? Okay, and Nicola, if you do, you know, I'll be around. I'll, I think for office hours, email me. If you would like office hours, email me the, what times during the next 24 hours you would be available, and I'll email you back, and we'll set something up, okay? Um, yeah, I'll just sometimes, usually because of the language barrier, I'll just uh, tell you after the class to make sure if I understand everything well but, uh, about uh, me being available. I'm available whenever you need me to uh, just, uh, I'm, I'm, although I'm the part of the men's basketball, so only yeah. when I have practices, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you have classes and practices and you got to eat, you know, you have stuff. Um, yeah. And I have stuff, but within 24 hours, because I have so few students, I do, it's just, you might as well take advantage of that and I'll be available, so. Um, all right, now the next, um, I have a paper rubric, I have a speaking rubric, um, and I have a list. So I, I think that I don't need to go over those things now. I will start with the lecture for today. And I hope, Nicola, you can sort of just get on board and get a sense of how it's going. Um, so I wanted to ask um, Enika and Bradley what they came up with. There are questions here 
boy, the lettering is so small. I don't know, I'm not quite sure how to make it bigger, but all right. So I, I just put these questions. So basically this class is not about you answering my questions or getting the right answer. It's not. I ask questions for you to, to blow your mind, right? Oh, there's a lot to think about and try to free associate and try to just expand your vision of what's out there in the world and what it is we can learn from the Greeks. And this is all of Europe, you know, has been influenced by Greek culture um, one way or another. And so, and America supposedly was, you know, but uh times change in general you would say that especially after world war ii the torch was passed to america to represent democracy and we picked it up and we established the united nations and nato and uh the world trade or there was a lot of stuff that we helped set up because we were gonna be this big democratic beacon. <laughs> okay, it's 70 years later, like what's happened? Um, and you do need to think about that because history is recording all of this. Every history book you read is gonna have, this is gonna be part of it. What happened to America? But anyway, um, the questions, why do you think Americans or anyone still studies the Greeks? What do you know or what have you heard about the Greeks? Um, uh, what do you know about Greek mythology? Um, and how does it tie with why we would study it? I, you know, I don't think students have ever been given any sort of coherent view of what the heck is going on. Uh, what do you think makes a society great? And what do you think corruption is? And what makes any society corrupt? And what is it about America or American society that makes it great? And what makes it corrupt? Okay, so Bradley, do you want to start? Oops, Bradley, turn Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um so do you want me to run through uh, all of my answers in a row or do you want me to just start with the first one and then we'll uh, go into oh. the next person? Okay, well, why don't you do two? If you have, did you answer all five? Oh, there's five? Because on the stream, it five is blank. Oh, good. Okay. Four, that's fine. Just go ahead and do about half of what you have. Okay, let me pull up the document. So for the first question, I kind of deviated a little bit from what you asked because you're asking specifically about uh, how uh, why people study ancient Greece, and I kind of answered why people study history in general. Good. I believe I believe my answer also applies to ancient Greece, and I said that um, there's uh, I believe two reasons why people study history um, or ancient Greece specifically. One is because um, history can often relate to and provide much needed insight into current events. And the other, and this is uh, a quote from George uh, Santayana, who is a yes. philosopher. Um, Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Very good. I know that quote. Very good. Okay. Um, all right. Enika, did you have something? Um, I just think it's the historical events about the religions of the gods. Okay. Um, what did you say? You didn't hear me? Kind of, but... I was talking about the, uh, the religions of the gods in the uh, Greek mythology. Okay, so what did you say about it? I just, it's just a, can you pull the question back up? Oh, well, why do we study ancient Greece? And what have you, what do you know about the Greek myths? 
And why do you think we study them? That's all. Okay. Have you studied anything about ancient Greece before? Yeah, we did. We studied the uh, Greek mythology, but that was in high school. We just yeah, uh, okay. We had our own God that we had to talk about in person. Okay. Was there any takeaway you got from all of that, or did it just? Psh, I don't get why I had to study that. Yeah. That's okay. I mean, it's fine with me. Um, hopefully, after you you know I talk for a little while, you'll figure out. Well, maybe I could have learned a lot more from that. Okay. What about you, Nicola? Did you did you study anything about Greece in high school? Well, I'm kind of familiar, but my answer to that question probably would be because Greece uh, is one of the oldest countries in the world, if not the oldest. I'm not sure, but uh, back in the history, they have a lot of great minds, right? Aristotle, uh, Python, uh, not Python. Uh, they have like, they have a lot of great uh, minds who have a lot of quotes that uh, people are still holding to this day and uh, they had more their thinking for that area so i guess that's really the reason why everybody are looking up to the degrees and um yeah that's what I, I would say okay very good do you learn about it at all in high school in serbia well yeah yeah we kind of did um we learn about their wars um about a lot of a lot of history is connected to mostly the history of the Europe is connected to Greece and uh, Rome. So yeah, I kind of I kind of I kind of know something. Okay. Um, all right, Bradley, go ahead and say the rest of your say. Uh, well, my answer for the second question is uh, to be honest that I don't actually know much of ancient Greece, so I can't really tell you uh, anything about uh what what about greek mythology actually ties into why americans would study the greeks okay that's fine um intellectual honesty right um mm -hmm. all right so why don't i start out here and i think i'll talk maybe for a little while and then get your reaction so i'm not going to just lay a whole 40 minute lecture on you I'm gonna stop and you have to react, okay guys? That's what's nice about a small class. Um, okay. All right, so here is the deities, the Greek deities, and what the overall theme is what I call spiritual humanism and the definition of spirit that is implicit in Greek culture and that Socrates made explicit in the symposium is that we, by nature, desire to understand the world. We're capable of understanding patterns and we, by nature, want to live for something greater than ourselves. We're designed to live for something greater than ourselves. And so each Greek deity represents one of those sacred passions, something that we that human beings can live for that's sacred. It's by nature important. The trouble is each of the deities represents what happens to people when all they can think about is that one thing and they get obsessed about it and then they do damage to everybody else who also has a legitimate claim to be respected and honored. So uh, let me explain this. So human beings have to balance these things out. All right, so what are they? First of all, human beings, start out in families, okay? And the family unit is focused on survival of a child, but also getting them habituated, basic habituation for self-control, controlling impulsivity and fear, learning how to, to overcome fears and without, you know, 
excessive exposure to fear, but without becoming too passive. Um, so pleasure and fear, they also learn um, how to avoid anger, become even tempered, how to develop friendships, how to for people to encourage each other. I mean, basically, a kid should learn how to love being alive and to really love uh, being self-controlled, helping other people follow the golden rule. Because as Bradley says, we are all equal. So kids need to be conditioned to treat people like they're equal. Um, so that's the family. And then societies came together originally to live more efficiently. So it was mostly economic motive that um, somebody can, well, you're, you're more protected from wild animals or from outside invasions if you come together in bigger groups. So there was this efficiency. That's what Aristotle calls a village. And then at a certain point in history, societies became complex enough that it dawned on somebody that we can relate to each other in a much higher way that's dedicated to the good life. We can decide to create a community where the goal is to enable as many people as possible to flourish and develop their natural capabilities to the highest level possible. And that would require um, a middle class. And you also have to have the goal of passing on a flourishing society from one generation to the next. And that is political association. In order to do that, you have to have laws and institutions. You are citizens living together under a common body of laws. Um, all right, so, uh, all right, what are the laws about? Well, if people, the situation of efficiency, um, somebody, people, um, just started out with the barter system and then money was invented. And so then people could use money to exchange things. But Aristotle said and Plato that greed is the political evil. When people want more than their share, when they just want to accumulate for the sake of accumulation beyond what they need, then Money sticks to money. They can design a society where they get richer and richer and the poor get poorer and poorer. And that creates, um, well, it prevents flourishing and it destabilizes a society, becomes unstable. And then eventually, if there's enough lawlessness, an authoritarian leader, someone who seeks power will say, you should bring, put me in power and I will fix everything. I will control the instability. So greed ruins flourishing societies. Um, and that's a pattern he sees in history. So um, loving justice, knowing how to make laws and institutions, knowing how to apply the laws, knowing how to enforce the laws in a way that promotes flourishing is a very, very sacred passion. Some people are better at it than others. And the children who grow up and you start to notice that they actually could do this um, should be given opportunities. Every, everyone should be given as many opportunities as possible to develop citizen consciousness. But some people will be better at it than others and they should be given more positions. But there's a constantly challenging people to go further and further in understanding the common good. All right, so Zeus and Athena represent the god and goddess of justice. Athena is actually also the goddess of wisdom because she's wiser than her father. Her father makes mistakes that Athena doesn't make. 
Um, then there's honor. So in every uh, society, in every organization, institution, they have an honor day. And what, what does that represent? It, remembers, it represents people who go over and above what the rules require. And you honor people for creating a high quality of life over and beyond a high quality of community over and beyond what any laws could require. So honor day at Lyon, we just had it recently and they, uh, they have the employee of the year. And they always talk about what this employee did that went way beyond what they were required to do. It's a staff member. And that's always really good. And it deserves to be honored. So Hera is the goddess of honor. Ares is the god of war because people are often honored most for their um, success in war. So you could say, well, that's not true of the United States anymore. Well, I would say that the reason Mr. Trump is honored is because people think that he was very successful in business. And that's the new, uh, you know, war, <laughs> war grounds. Like that's where economic wars are wars. You know, they're competitive and they're adversarial. And um, people think that he's able to win those economic wars. Um, I think if you look at the data, <laughs> He was not a good businessman, but it doesn't matter. In this sense, the reason he's respected is because people think he was good at winning the economic wars. Um, but we also have the plain old, we have cyber war now, and then we have boots on the ground war. But it's important to expand your idea of war, something that's competitive and somebody takes risks and, and wins. Okay, then there's sensuality, the god of wine and the and of the theater and the goddess of beauty. So this, the Greeks were not anti-sensual. The sensuality is part of life and you need to incorporate it in your life. And um, so they, they had the muses, they had dance and theater and music. All of that is good. It educates the soul because it educates emotions. Dionysus is also the god of the theater. And in the theater, people are living out irrational emotions and you're supposed to flush them out of your psyche. Oh, I really don't want to do that. So Dionysus is the only god who dies and is reborn. So that represents what the tragedy and Homer are doing. You're supposed to become aware of your capacity for evil and bring it to consciousness and then flush it out. And then you're reborn because you can be creative. You can do something creative. Okay, the God uh, Apollo and Artemis are twins. Apollo is the god of reason. The god of reason is the god of science, math, technology, um, argumentation, uh, rhetoric, um, all, so all sorts of words and concepts. Apollonian reasoning creates cities, right? Buildings, skyscrapers, all that stuff is created through Apollonian reasoning. Artemis is the goddess of the woods the woods woman. And so you have to remember, you have to respect the wilderness too, not just the city. Um, Demeter and Poseidon are the god and goddess of natural, representing natural forces that human beings cannot control. And if they do, these deities are going to fight back. So Poseidon is the god of the sea. And we are definitely arrogant and we're arrogantly overstepping our bounds and we're getting a piece of it, right? We're getting hurricanes and we're getting floods and we're getting all this stuff because of our hubris, our pride. Demeter is the goddess of fertility, the goddess of the earth, the goddess of human fertility. And again, we're destroying the earth with our hubris and our greed and our pride and we're denying it. And um, 
And actually human fertility is going down. Actually the sperm counts are 40% lower than they used to be. So we are truly using our technology to destroy life on earth. And that's how I got into Greek philosophy is that I, uh, you know, I was an environmentalist and I thought about this and the culture is designed to tell you, don't overstep your bounds, develop sustainable cultures. Um, introspection is um, Hephaestus is the God of the forge, the God of crafts, and he makes beautiful things so that people in their houses are surrounded by beauty. And Hestia is the goddess of the hearth. And you, there's a little plaque to her in every house. And they have a, there's a, a hearth. People come together at home. That's where you first start talking about the serious questions of life, how to live, uh, what to do. And then, um, so the flame is kindled, the light of your mind is kindled at home, at the hearth. And then Hermes is the god of the, who carries his torch and carries the messages from the gods to the earth. So those insights that you get at home, you take out in the public eye and you spread them to the rest of the culture. And then Hades and Persephone are about what is the legacy you want to leave behind? What is, um, what's the story that you want people to tell about you after you've gone? Do you want people to learn how to live because they remember, oh yeah, that's the way my grandpa did it or my mother did it or whatever. And then Persephone is the one who was raped and abducted. She was a victim. And if you were bad, if you were wicked, Persephone will victimize you forever, right? This is the hellfire and brimstone one. Um, anyway, so that's just a real general picture. And then the stories, the myths are about these gods, you know, interacting with human beings and people being possessed by one of these and causing a lot of damage because they can't, they don't respect the other ones. So they fight among themselves. So the gods fight among themselves. Um, the gods influence people who fight among themselves and then people fight among themselves. So, I mean, there's so many stories, but, um, oh, I guess the first one that comes to mind for me would be that Artemis is a woods woman and she also delivers babies and she understands the abuse. She hears stories of women being abused. She becomes a man hater. She just doesn't like men. And um, Aphrodite, of course, the goddess of beauty, she's always um, uh, shooting her arrows into men's hearts or into the gods' hearts. And they want to have sex with some woman. And it causes a lot of chaos in the society. And so uh, there's a story of when Artemis took revenge on Aphrodite, right? And, um, and so you're thinking, when you hear these stories, you're thinking in, the, in your unconscious, have these seeds been planted? Do people actually live out this kind of stuff? And you know, when you're watching a play where they're living it out, you're supposed to recognize that those seeds are planted in the back of your mind well, and that, but maybe that isn't your weakness. You're not really like that, but you know somebody else like that. And so people don't have to literally act this stuff out, but psychologically they hurt each other. They do damage to each other because of their um, extreme, because they're at an extreme. And so all the tragedies, um, Homer is trying to bring all this crap into consciousness, but of the good and the evil, the good that we could do and the evil that we often do do to try and flesh out the bad side, the thanatos. So there's eros, we can create a better society. 
And then there's thanatos, the we can destroy things. So it's trying to flush out this destructive side that's often based on fear, our awareness of our vulnerability. Um, okay, so we are vulnerable, but we don't want to overreact and become obsessed about something because that just makes it worse. And then flush that out and then you can be creative. Let's move forward. Let's create something better. Um, then the muses are all the ways that you sort of tap into the collective unconscious and make it conscious and also make uh, train people to want to be creative because a creative life, a life where people get along with each other is a much better life. You will be way happier if you promote human well-being. Okay, so there's music, um, there's history. Like Bradley says, we learn from history. Um, the actually sex drive is not supposed to be just about sex. It's about creativity, right? Um, so when someone is your muse, it means they inspire you to be creative. Um, okay, let's see. Um, poetry. Um, oh, religious poetry, where you're honoring higher powers. Um, tragedy, dance, um, astronomy and astrology, and comedy, right? And epic poetry. So all of those are different forms of ways that the medium that you can use to educate. So, all right. Um, anybody have a reaction to that? Any first reactions? Um, Bradley, do you have a reaction? Uh, yes, there were a couple of comments I had to some of the things you said. Uh, I remember at the beginning, you mentioned there was that, um, if I could pull it up, about wanting to leave a legacy that by nature, we want to kind of leave a legacy. And I do agree with that because I feel like a very common feeling among, among people is if, if it's not wanting to be famous or something, they don't, they definitely don't want to be forgotten. And I feel like that's a very strong motivator to that leads to leaving a legacy in some form. Okay. And the other comment I had was in relation to what you said about uh, greed being one of the great evils of society. And that I, I, what I wanted to add to that is one of my answers to uh, question three, which was, um, if I can check, um, what makes a society corrupt? I said uh, arrogance is what makes a society corrupt. This idea that, oh, we're so great, we can do whatever we want, and there won't be any consequences. Okay, good. American exceptionalism, right? <laughs> you can well, not say. only that, actually, I've been going to Greece for the last 20 years, and th there's a Greek exceptionalism too, because they're in heavy debt there. And, you know, they all thought, yeah, but Europe isn't going to let us default, you know, because we're Greece. I was like, wait a sec. <laughs> okay. Do you understand that, Nicola? <laughs> you know that Greece has been in debt, right? Probably. Yeah. Yeah. They had a uh, cries a couple of years ago. And they were in a big debt. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I remember the newspaper when I was there, it says this big, you know, thing, Greeks that work for the government, they now have to work 40 hours a week. Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> I mean, Americans work way more hours than people in Europe. Europeans have six weeks paid, you know, vacation, guys. This is that horrible socialism. If you start finding out about socialism, you might not think it's so horrible. Um, Okay, Nicola, was there something that you thought? Well, I was always wondering why uh, back in the, uh, in the history, why Greece always had that many gods, but you mentioned a lot of fear. I guess uh, the people who weren't so social that they were by on their own, uh, they had problems and then they were looking for someone to motivate them. And then that's why I guess uh, all the thing with the gods started. Um, to you know 
uh, when the, and that many uh, gods is like if they go to war, they pray to Arias. Is that how you call it? Yeah, Aries, yeah. Self beauty problems, they pray to Aphrodite or uh, I don't know stuff like that. I think that's how it all began. Began, but yeah, that's something I noticed from your lecture. Okay, good. Well, they had a lot more gods than that. It's just that you know Hesiod and Homer tried to sort of make sense out of them and make it into some system that a person could actually think about. Um, all right, good. What about you, Annika? Did you have a reaction? Uh, yes, um, I wrote down when you said greed ruins pattern society. Um, I do agree with that because when laws are being created, most people feel like they don't have to follow them or you know, they just think they can do whatever they want basically without being- Yeah, told. I mean, history is going to say that we don't have a democracy. We have an oligarchy, the rule of the rich. And, um, and we keep thinking it's an exception, like, yeah, but that's okay because we're different. It's like, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, I think we're gonna go the way that every other society has gone when, it's, when the rich get too rich. Um, so I've taught this material for 40 years, 50 years, um, but it's, I mean, it's so obvious that we're in an oligarchy now that I, I think I can say it, that income inequality is so horrible. It's way worse than it was before the depression. Um, and so, and we're gonna have to deal with it. Uh, and there is a lot of denial and there's a lot of ob obfuscation, like the politicians don't talk about it because, uh, because they're getting their campaigns funded by the super rich. So the super, you know, politicians become more and more the puppets of the rich, that they win elections because of this money. And then once they win it, they do whatever the campaign donor tells them to do. And those are laws made in the favor of the rich. Does everybody understand that? I mean, this is like a fact. It's not an opinion anymore. I used to go, well, maybe that's happening. You know, you could think about it. It's just, uh, yeah. The question is, what are we going to do about it? But anyway, so now I want to do my little lecture about being Plato, okay? All right. So my name is Plato. Can you guys see me at all? Am I there? Am I on speaker? Yes. Yep. Okay, so here I am. At least now I can put on my little thing that I got from Greece. Uh, okay. All right. So I'm going to tell you the story about my life. Um, oh, my goodness. I thought I, I've done this many times. I'm trying to figure out how to do it on full screen. This is weird. <sighs> well, we're just going to have it have it on a little tiny screen then because I, I need to go on unless it's, are you shared? Can you see it? Yeah, I think you click on slideshow. Slideshow? Yeah. Thanks a lot. Okay. You're um, all right. So my name is Plato and I, it's a nickname. It means fat. So although, <laughs> Although it either means I was fat or I had broad shoulders. Nobody can quite figure it out, but that's okay. So, okay, I've come from the dead and I wanna tell you some things. Um, I consider myself to be a pretty universal thinker. I think in patterns, I don't, I don't favor my own, right? My family, my city state, my religion, except that I just think I happened to be born into a city state at a time where I was lucky. This was pure luck because I do think Athens had the best kind of social and political life that anybody had ever thought of before. Um, and, and my uncle Solon had written, been the major uh, author of the constitution of Athens. He wrote it because the city-states in Greece 
kept falling into civil wars because the oligarchs, the rich, kept um, using their authority to get richer. And they always would justify it, saying, well, the reason we're, we're on top is because we're unequal. We're better than the poor, and we're better at knowing how to rule. And so they use that, that they're by nature better or that they're by culture better. They've, their families have taught them how to rule generation after generation. And they use that to justify centralizing power. Well, and the poor finally got so frustrated and angry that they'd have a civil war. So the poor would take over and they'd always have some strong man telling, leading them because they needed a leader, then they killed off all the people who knew how to run the society. They either killed them, ran them out of the city or put them in jail. So they didn't have any leadership. So then the strong man has this huge amount of power so he can put his friends and, and family in charge of everything and they're incompetent. And so they say they're competent and they, you know, they misrule the society, they shrink the middle class again, and there's another civil war. So, so Solon just got fed up and he was able to go to Athens and design a constitution that wove the rich and the poor together. And that was the goal. And I just, he happened to be my uncle. I happened to grow up in Athens and it had so much that was valuable. So here's how the city was. The temple, this is the temple to Athena, the goddess of wisdom, justice, and war, but it's always a just war, not an unjust war. So she had this little half-brother named Ares, and he always just wanted to go to war to show how brave he was. And she was always telling him, no, <laughs> No, I'm only going to send you to war when it's a just cause and you can't overreact. Um, no brutality in war. Um, anyway, so she was the goddess of Athens, right? She was the patron goddess. And her shadow, right? Everywhere people looked, they could see Athena and that would remind them of what they're supposed to be doing and how they're supposed to be living. So on the, the level of the earth, you have families. And then here's the theater. You gradually go up to the top and families and also economic association. This is where the commercial centers are. And then you start moving up and you start educating your soul for um, democracy. So here's the uh, Parthenon. And the way you walk up are on these shallow steps that are not very high and they're pretty deep because as you walk up to the temple, you're not supposed to forget your biological nature. They're all interconnected. So if you go to the Europe and you look at the cathedrals, they're built right in the middle of the city. The city is dirty and ugly and noisy and awful. And you step into that cathedral and it's like a rocket ship to heaven. There's this huge difference between this world and the next world is the way it's designed. That is not the Greeks. The Greeks are, you're a biological animal, but you're a rational animal. So you have to integrate your biology, all aspects of your life and construct a society where you're able to flourish in every way, but especially at that level of ruling for the sake of the ruled and having laws and institutions, because that's what maintains stability over time. So you could have personal virtues, which is great, but they have to get tied to these institutions and history. You have to build a whole history into a society. Um, all right, so the way the temple was built was the columns were slightly out of proportion so that they would look like they were proportionate because we have a natural response to beauty because the natural world is ordered. 
And we learned how to flourish by paying attention to that order. So to some extent, that order, we paid attention in order to survive, but we also developed just an aesthetic appreciation for beauty and proportionality. And so that's built into the architecture. Uh, again, you're integrating your biological nature with your cultural nature. Um, all right. Then right next to that is a, is a courthouse because Athena is the goddess of wisdom, justice, and war. And so the courthouse is the place where human beings take that power that Athena gives to them. So each one of these deities possesses you, like you have the power of Athena. You're supposed to use that power when you go to a court of law and you start creating laws and you start enforcing laws and you start um, governing yourselves. So human beings are supposed to create these cultures where they govern themselves, but with the possession, with the insights given to them by the deities. Okay, then on the side of the, of the Acropolis is the theater. And the theater is where people go to educate their emotions. And so these stories are told about the gods or human beings or the relationship between them where um, a person lives out a fantasy. So for example, um, sibling rivalry, like brothers that compete against brothers. And that competition causes all sorts of other people to suffer, especially the, the tragedies were mostly about uh, people kings or leaders in societies. And when they had family problems, they took their whole city state to war to, to take revenge on a brother who, um, you know, mistreated another brother. And so you go to the tragedy, you watch this being played out. So you yourself, I don't know about you all, but I can ask, have you ever had a revenge fantasy? Has somebody ever mistreated you and you really wanted to take revenge? Okay, well, that's what those plays are starting, are trying to touch on, is that um, you, they remind you of these emotions that you either acted out on and caused a lot of problems, or they just bother you. They're part of your psyche that's getting you down and destroying you, preventing you from moving on, like you get fixated on it. So, or if it isn't about you, it's like, oh, that, that family, I have a friend who has a family where the, bro the brothers are competing and it's causing so much destruction. Or, you know, there's lots of different kinds of complexes that people have. And so it's trying to educate you because it's preventing you from being a good citizen. That's the main thing. Then there's the Olympics. And that was also designed to promote democracy because the city states would came together to create a body of common laws that they applied to each other equally. So um, anyway, I'm gonna have to quit there but we will continue that um, next, next Tuesday. But I would like you to just keep going on the assignments that I have listed, right? So, oh gosh, all right. Um, keep going, let's see, I wanna get back to the, um, to the original stream, okay. Where is the stream? I don't know why it's giving me this different kind of presentation than I've ever had before. Um, well, okay, go here. So there you have that. And then for next time, 
read this Euthyphro dialogue. So here's the text, it's like 11 pages, and it's a different kind of reading. Just write down your reflections. Um, what do you think it means to be righteous or holy? Whatever you think it is that causes a preacher to be a preacher, right? Um, and then read the other posts after that. So that's, I think I have the assignments pretty specific. The other thing is that you need to post your first post, okay? So under classwork, I have post number one. Um, come on. Okay. View more. Post number one. And uh, at least 150 words for each day. And one is the worldview. Um, and then your three reactions before and your three reactions, two or three reactions during the class. And then your final takeaway, is there um, something from this, this lecture that you wanna put in your final worldview and why? So the first one will be mostly your worldview and don't worry about it. Don't worry if you've got it right, just start free associating, start thinking about the material and getting to know your own mind. Like what's on my mind? Um, what did I learn from the material? Do you have any questions about that? So just to make sure we need to do that uh, 11 page reading and uh, where do we, uh, and then we comment that on the post you just showed to us, right? Yeah, okay, so you, start a second post, right? You have one post that you hand in. It's supposed to be tomorrow by three o'clock, okay? Um, or normally it's on Friday, the day after the last class at seven o'clock at night. So just write your worldview, basically, Nicola, and your reactions to the class. It's really, I'm not gonna be very particular. And then when you start for next time, you read the 11 pages and write some, and then the other stuff, and just write at least three comments about what you wanna bring up in class, what stuck out to you, okay? Okay, I, I'll email you if I don't, don't understand something, if that's okay. You'll email me what? If I don't understand something. Yes, that's fine, okay. Any other questions for anyone? Okay, so, um, Good luck, we'll see you. And it is recorded. I will send you the recording via email and then I will post it on the YouTube channel, which uh, it's uh, Martha Catherine Beck, PhD philosophy. Okay, I think I have that written down also. Bye-bye, it's time to go.